Sleepapnea.org presents Portraits, Living with Sleep Apnea, a conversation with Dr. A. Joseph Borelli. Dr. Borelli, tell us how sleep deprivation can be deadly. I would say that day that I collapsed in the shower, I sort of realized that this is, you know, I was literally suicidal at that point, and that's about as rock bottom as you can get. And as we know that um, insomnia is sort of the number one association with suicide now, and I experienced that. And it's just the point where you see that you continue to decline cognitively like someone that might have Alzheimer's disease, and it's very slow, it's very insidious. And you get to the point where you realize that you're, um, you really cannot function, you're a basket case, right? And you just cannot go, go on any further. I sort of reached that point earlier and sought out you know, the healthcare system, but because of the type of sleep breathing disorder I have, I was misdiagnosed. And I said, ultimately, I have to go find the best expert in the world, in my opinion. And that's when I went to Stanford and saw Dr. Gimeno. And when he saw me initially, he just said, Dr. Borelli, open your mouth. And he looked in my mouth, he shook his head and took two steps backward. And he said, you've had this sleep disorder your entire life. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, I was hospitalized for a week with a blood pressure of 150 over 100, which would be considered you know, lethal long-term in an adult. And my pediatric cardiologist told me that I would probably not live past 21. Told my parents, and my parents relayed that to me. And, uh, and at that time, ironically, that's the year, 72, that Dr. Gimeno published his first paper that linking the association of sleep apnea and pediatric hypertension, high blood pressure. Did CPAP treatment yield immediate results? The first night that I used CPAP properly, when I was properly diagnosed and what, they call, which, what we call titrated, they adjust your pressure overnight in the sleep lab at Stanford, and they, they keep raising the pressure until they see that the airway opens up and you're breathing freely. Um, the first night that I used CPAP properly, I woke up a different person. It was just, wow. I mean, I could hear better. I could see everything better. I could, it's just like I was alive again. And prior to that, I described the feeling of being in a fog. It's almost like there's a veil between me and my surroundings and my environment, whether it's what I'm listening to, inattentiveness, remembering things, short-term memory, meeting someone and not remembering their name 10 seconds later, all that started lifting. And it took months for that to lift to the point where I said, wow, I'm pretty much back doors. I, said, I would say I came back about 90%. And I remember asking Dr. Gimeno, I said, will I come back? And he said, because, I, because the type of sleep apnea I have is called upper airway resistance syndrome, where every breath is a struggle. I don't breathe, 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 then stop, and then wake up and breathe again. That's sort of classic sleep apnea. I have a problem where my whole airway is very tight and narrow, and I struggle with every breath. So every time I take a breath, my body's going, wow, you're almost drowning. It's like being waterboarded throughout the night. I think that's the best uh, uh, description of it because you're struggling to breathe with every breath and that kicks in your fight or flight response, which kicks in adrenaline and, uh, and cortisol from the brain. And that throughout the night keeps you in this aroused state that whole time. And that's what I was experiencing day after day after day. And, and once that lifted up, once that fell away, my body gradually started to return to normal. But those effects were long-term and they don't go away completely. But with my type of uh, airway problem, upper air resistance syndrome, my blood oxygen level doesn't drop to the point where it causes permanent brain damage as it does in some people. And that's why he was optimistic in saying, um, we think you probably will recover. And again, I, I believe I recovered about roughly 90%. You know, if, I, if you tested my memory and IQ and those sorts of things before and after, there was a big difference. How did you make sure that improvement continued? Having that feeling that first day and then continuing on that motivated me. This is really the first time I went to bed knowing the next day, after this first time, the next day, going to bed knowing that, hey, I'm probably going to feel better when I wake up than when I went to bed. Whereas for years, when I, put my, when my, when I lay my head down on the pillow, it was a, there was a great sense of anxiety because I knew I'm going to wake up feeling worse, feeling not just tired, but agitated, and, and it's, it's a horrible feeling. It's a, some people relate it to being like hit by a truck. 
you know? So it's actually worse than being sleep deprived, the way I was feeling, because again, I'm being agitated throughout the night, like being waterboarded. You can imagine how difficult it is to fall asleep under those circumstances. And that's why people develop insomnia. 90% of people that have insomnia, and this is really important, if this is the number one message for everyone to take home here, for the physicians that might be listening to this, uh, Barry Krakow in a huge study over, over 10 years showed that 90% of people that have chronic insomnia shouldn't be going to get cognitive behavioral therapy, shouldn't be going to have all these alternative therapies or buying a my pillow at two in the morning online or on TV. They need to have their airway opened up, right? And that's causing all these other comorbidities. Insomnia, which then is the number one association with suicide and also causes depression and what have you. And um, so yeah, so that once I had that feeling in the morning, wow, I actually feel better than I went to bed. It was, it was a revelation, it was remarkable. I was very highly motivated to continue using the CPAP, but I struggled with it because the various different ways that the device interfaces to, your, to, your, to the human body, we call it the interface, whether it's something that goes under your nose, a mask that covers part of your face, a mask that covers all of your face, all these different things are different in the way they attach are different and everyone's face is different. It took me about a year to become comfortable with that and have it work so that it didn't leak. And because of my struggle with that, even though I'm a physician and I've got resources and I've got access to, uh, to the companies that make this equipment, if it took me a year, you can imagine uh, someone that's not in the healthcare field, how long they're gonna have trouble, how, how difficult it's gonna be for them and that motivated me to go to Philips Respironics and encourage them to develop an app that would coach people to get to remain compliant on CPAP therapy. And that app was called Sleep Mapper. They subsequently named it Dream Mapper. That was all voluntary on my part. How did your treatment improve? When I was initially diagnosed with sleep apnea, the treatment was CPAP or PAP therapy. Um, and I was originally prescribed a fixed pressure with constant, that remained constant throughout the night. And while it did work, it was uncomfortable. It was like breathing against a balloon when I would breathe out. And so I eventually changed to a device that would allow me to have decreased pressure as I ex exhaled. It's called BiPAP therapy. And I went back to Stanford and I I'd set, made the adjustments on the machine myself and I said, I can't do this with a the constant therapy. I have to have this relief. I have to feel like I can exhale. And they ultimately agreed to prescribe that for me, although I could make the settings. And then ultimately they changed the whole policy of the department to prescribe BiPAP. So that was one change. Another change was I found a mask that fit properly and covered my nose and my mouth because I do breathe through my mouth. I got to that point. But that took, and then there were some, some changes in pressures and things. I got retitrated uh, again at Stanford. But that whole, that whole process took about a year. And the problem with the healthcare system now is there are no resources available to patients. There's no what's called a CPT code, a billing code, where you can go and someone will help you and follow you and look at the, your, the data on your machine to see how you're doing. And therefore make these adjustments or make sure you're not leaking. If you go to the machine, the machines now store tremendous amounts of data, whether it's leaking, how well the therapy is working, it's right there, but there isn't any aren't resources available to sort of have that kind of coaching. And that's why I thought an app would help at least educate the patients. How is life with CPAP compared to life without it? Compared to the way I felt prior to CPAP and now with CPAP, I have a life again. I literally was thinking about taking my own life because I thought I had no hope. I continued to deteriorate. So just that, just, you know, even if it was only 50% effective, it would be a miracle for me in, in terms of influencing my quality of life, right? Um, I can remember people's names. I'm not as anxious as I used to be because we, we know that sleep breathing disorders cause anxiety for a number of reasons. I don't like to go into the details. I didn't have depression is issues. Um, I could function better in my practice as a physician. And it motivated me to do these other things that are voluntary and to help people with, with sleep breathing disorders. It was, it was like night and day. It's like literally the, the fog lifting on my cognitive abilities, my memory, my interrelationships with 
people with friends, family members, loved ones, everything improved dramatically. It went from being almost an invalid to being alive again. It's that simple. Doctor, what are some benefits of the Awake Together Summit? The benefits of this conference today are, are manifold. But I think ultimately it's about awareness of how common this disorder is. We're only, the people that are here are the very tiny tip of the iceberg of people that have, people that have been treated for the disease versus people that have the disease. I believe that at least 40% of the population suffers from this. I have a really extraordinary point of view. I believe everyone would benefit from a machine that would monitor and adapt your breathing throughout the night if we could make it cost effective. Because even if someone that has a normal airway, there are gonna be times when if they uh, maybe have a cold or their airway is narrowed for that reason, or maybe they've had some alcohol and they can't maintain their airway open because their CN central nervous system has been depressed, this would kind of be as a backstop and to give us 100% quality sleep every night. Can you imagine what that would do? Let alone the people that have the, the sleep breathing disorders. So I think it's just, I think the main point is get awareness so there's, so that mainly, I believe the biggest benefit early on is to have physicians in primary care identify the sooner. If someone comes in and they're depressed, think about sleep. Someone has reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease, think about sleep. If someone has insomnia, my goodness, they've got a sleep breathing disorder. First of all, get a sleep study before you even send them for cognitive behavioral therapy. Rule that out first. I think the main thing would be awareness because there's so little awareness and the first step before you want to have change is to have awareness. What is your advice to someone who thinks they may need help? Very simple. If you're tired and don't feel well rested every morning and you're having difficulty with sleep and you worry about sleep, you probably have a sleep breathing disorder, insist on being tested. There's a low cost method I think is very effective. I have no financial interest at all in a company called Itamar that makes WatchPat. It's a device you wear on your wrist. It's nearly as good, or I think in many cases better than the in-lab sleep studies. You wear it overnight at home. It costs about $250 to have the test performed. Insist on being tested. Don't let your doctor tell you you don't have sleep apnea because you're a thin, young female, for example, which is sort of the opposite of the prototypical overweight, middle-aged male, which is a big misconception. Get tested, insist on it, and you know, the WatchPad study may be cost effective if you uh, can't afford it otherwise. A sleep studies cost several thousand dollars. What is the future of sleep health? I'm, I sort of focus more on the technical side. I come from, come from a technical background. Um, I did a lot of work with Apple and app development. I think uh, technology will ultimately be the answer. I, I think I alluded to it a little earlier. I think we will eventually come up with a device that is much more comfortable, smaller, lighter. The machine will be smaller and lighter and it will be able to actually look at your brain waves in real time. Because that's the only way we can tell for sure whether you're getting deep sleep, what we call N3 level sleep, the deepest sleep, which is the most restorative sleep, which is the most protective against developing Alzheimer's disease. We now know that, we now know that the brain cells shrink shrink 40% in volume during deep sleep, which allows the toxins that normally that would otherwise build up in Alzheimer's disease to build up. And I think that may be one of the main functions of, of sleep. So if we can monitor the brainwave activity very, and for the very lightly invasive, something non-invasive, non something that attaches to your, to your scalp, or maybe a little cap you wear, or even something even less with, with, uh, with the low cost electronic monitoring devices we have, like Apple Watch, that sort of gives us an idea of where we're gonna go with this. I think we, we could really accurately monitor everyone's sleep at low cost and screen the entire population. Or monitor, continuously monitor the entire population, not centrally, patients will be able to monitor themselves. And so we could then monitor everyone for this, diagnose it earlier, intervene before uh, the, the other comorbid conditions kick in, such as we, we talked about earlier, you know, of insomnia, depression, cardiovascular symptoms, cognitive issues, et cetera, et cetera. I think the future is very bright, and I think technology will ultimately be the answer for earlier diagnosis and intervention and population screening like we have for many other diseases. To learn more, visit sleepapnea.org now.